The Lord be with you and also with me. Uh, let us open with a prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we give you thanks for calling us to be your compassionate and your courageous witnesses in your church and in all your world. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the first ever Zoom Curry Lecture Series. My name is Richard Boyce. I'm privileged to serve as Dean of the Charlotte campus of Union Presbyterian Seminary. And it's my great privilege uh, to welcome you to this gathering here tonight uh, in honor of the Curry family and in honor of their commitment to church history and missions down through the generations. We've got a great group of people gathered here. Formal uh, introductions will follow. I do want to particularly thank our speaker, Erskine Clark, for his great patience and perseverance as we've shifted assignments and platforms under him. He has stayed steadfastly committed uh, to kicking this off tonight, and we do thank you, Erskine. I thank uh, Mike Frontero, who is uh, hosting this gathering, this webinar, and Tim Moore, who's behind the scenes and will be gathering questions. I thank all of you who have been part of planning this series. This is a longstanding series here on the Charlotte campus. No surprise, uh, it is deeply connected to our founding dean, Tom Curry, and his extended family, particularly his father, who shared a deep passion for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also for missions and service all over the world. Sometimes we set evangelism and service uh, over against one another, but that's not the vision and the witness of the Curry family, and that's certainly not the vision and the witness of this lecture series. So it happens we've got a couple of our former lecturers on our panel tonight, uh, and we're, it's great to have them here, but uh, we welcome all of you. We can't see you. That's one of the problems with the Zoom webinar. We're blind to the congregation. You can see us, but we can't see you. But I'm seeing 48 folks participating down at the bottom of my screen, and we welcome you all here. I just remind you of the purpose of this lecture series, given Curry's vocational interest in the connection between the church's historical work in its present mission, the lecture series seeks to explore that link, examining how the past might inform our present and direct us toward a faithful future. That's what our brother Erskine uh, is going to challenge us to do tonight, and I'm excited to welcome you to this occasion. It is my further privilege to welcome uh, our panelist here tonight, Dr. Adrian Bird is our primary moderator for the discussion tonight. Uh, Adrian's joining us from, I believe that's his wife's church office down in Columbia, South Carolina. Adrian is a faithful affiliate professor here on the Charlotte campus. He comes to us, as you'll hear in his accent, from uh, way of Edinburgh, where he did his doctoral studies in Dalit theology. He has a deep passion for lifting up the voices of those who are sometimes not heard uh, as part of the mission of Christ Church worldwide and a particular commitment to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that's generous towards all the world's faith. So we welcome our brother Adrian here tonight and thank him for his former contribution uh, to the Curry Lecture Series. Second, Stan Scresslett from Richmond, Virginia. Stan's our longest uh, serving professor on this panel. I think he's been with us at Union Presbyterian Seminary as a professor for 20 plus years, but Stan and I go back to prior to professorship days, and we thank uh, Stan for his consistent and constant uh, witness as part of the member of the faculty here. He is a graduate of Union Seminary, but did his doctoral work at Yale. Uh, as Adrian has a particular passion for India, uh, Stan brings a particular passion for the Church of Jesus Christ in Egypt. Uh, in missiology is Stan's passion. And uh, 
that you'll hear that come out in his questions for us tonight. He also happens to be a dean, which I didn't appreciate till I became a dean. And now I deeply appreciate the kind of gifts Stan brought uh, to that calling. Last but by no means least, James Tonetti, the newest member of the union faculty on this panel. He too comes to us by way of India, where he did most of his pre-graduate training. And uh, he then did some studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, a place our president knows a little bit about, and uh, also did his PhD, though, at Union uh, Presbyterian Seminary. Uh, I think he's joining us from Goldsboro, where his wife is on the staff at First Presbyterian Goldsboro as an educator. And James is now uh, the Sigmund Rhee Global Mission Center Director. And uh, James has a particular passion for broadening our conversation beyond the church just in North America to the church around the world. And uh, someday, James, you're going to be a speaker in the Curry Lecture Series. So we welcome all of you here and are grateful for your uh, participation. Again, a particular thanks to Erskine. Uh, as a preacher, I might simply say, I wonder about the title, I weep because I have a human heart. I might say, I weep because I have a spirit-filled human heart. So uh, we are looking forward, Erskine, to your summary of your lecture. I remind people that the full video and text are available, but he'll give us a brief summary and then we'll move to questions. Welcome. Thank you, Dean Boyce, and good evening. My name is Ed Robertson. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees at Union Presbyterian Seminary. It was back in the fall when Tim Moore was arranging to have Professor Clark's Curry family lecture coincide with our spring trustees meeting. Fast forward to March, and we were scrambling around, rearranging. It would be a very different kind of trustees meeting. I was concerned that Professor Clark's lecture might fall to the wayside. The lecture would go on, and like Tim said, lemons to lemonade. Not only would we proceed with the lecture, but because of Zoom technology, we would reach a wider audience. One more thing. I am proud to point out that Professor Clark is one of our very own, having earned his doctorate at Union. Thank you. It is my pleasure to re represent the trustees and to welcome Pro Professor Clark, my fellow panelists, and the wider audience. Thank you for joining us. President Blunt, I believe you can take it from here. Thank you, Ed. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here as president of the seminary. I am looking forward to having an opportunity to listen to Erskine and his presentation. Um, I have read the, um, the paper and just been intrigued by it, so I'm very much looking forward to the opportunity to hear him um, engage us uh, from this uh, wonderful uh, lecture that he has for us. I also want to um, welcome all of you um, as one of the faculty members um, who has been a colleague of Dean uh, Tom Curry. Uh, Tom was a wonderful uh, colleague in our midst, and of course, um, his work at the um, at the the uh, Charlotte uh, campus of Union Presbyterian Seminary was remarkable in the way in which he founded it, gave it its support and its grounding, and pushed it into the future. But also, he um, it's it's helpful to remember. He not only was the dean, but as Richard Boyce is the dean there, he taught a full schedule and a full load. So on Saturdays, he was teaching theology while he was then transitioning back to being dean um, on uh, Monday and through the rest of the week. Uh, so it is um, with great gratitude that we, um, as we think together about this evening and about these continuing Curry lectures, remember the gift of collegiality and scholarship that Tom brought to us during his time and the support, friendship, and concern and prayers that he and Peggy continue to give to us as we move forward. So I'm delighted that we are now in this fundraising phase to uh, prepare an, endow an endowment to support the Curry family chair um, in church history that would operate from the Charlotte campus. So on behalf of uh, the uh, seminary uh, staff, students and faculty as president, let me say to all of you, welcome.
Is there a speed limit? Dean boys, would you like to take me for, to take it from here? I thought that Erskine was going to say something first. Uh, according to the schedule I have, uh, Dean Boyce was to introduce the family annual lectureship, but you've, you've done that. So I will take it from here, if that's okay with you, Dean Boyce, and thank you for those great introductions. It is wonderful to be part of this prestigious Curry family lecture evening. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I have been tasked with establishing a few protocols to keep us on the straight and narrow. That's my hope anyway. Given that we are using the Zoom platform, you will sadly remain muted for the duration of our gathering. While that's not ideal, of course, it will enhance overall audio quality for all participants and particularly for our guest speaker this evening. Despite this restriction, however, your participation is highly encouraged by submitting your questions for Dr. Clark to respond. To do this, please locate and click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. It should be there on the menu. Once you click on Q&A, you will be able to type in your question. Following the summary presentation by Dr. Clark, we will have opening questions from this evening's moderating professors and then turn to your questions submitted in the Q&A room. My colleagues, Dr. Skreslet and Dr. Tanetti, will be monitoring the questions as they come in and will ask those questions on your behalf. I would encourage everyone to be patient, for we don't know what technological surprises might lie ahead, but know that we will do our best to smooth out any bumps as they might arise. And so we turn to the reason why we are all gathered here this evening. Professor Erskine Clark is Professor Emeritus of American Religious History at Columbia Theological Seminary. Dr. Clark received his doctorate in 1970 from Union Presbyterian Seminary under the careful direction of Jim Smiley and is the author of numerous publications on American religious history, including Dwelling Place, a Plantation Epic, for which he received Columbia University's prestigious Bancroft Prize for a distinguished work in American history. Dwelling Place was the originating catalyst for the opera Castor and Patience which has since been commissioned by the Cincinnati Opera for its 100th anniversary to be celebrated this coming July. And Dr. Clark's To Count Our Days, A History of Columbia Theological Seminary was published in 2019. Along with Walter Brueggemann, Dr. Clark is editor of the Journal for Preachers. And on a personal note, my wife, Julie, who is a Presbyterian pastor here in Columbia, is one of the multitude of former students nurtured under the wisdom and guidance of Dr. Clark. This evening, Dr. Clark will be offering a summary of his lecture entitled, I Weep Because I Have a Human Heart, Pandemics, Endemic Infections, and Early US Protestant Missions. Now, as we've heard earlier, this is not his original topic, but Dr. Clark graciously adapted his lecture to reflect the current global pandemic crisis. A full version of this lecture, as we've heard, in both written and video form was circulated prior to this event and is available for further review. For those who have already read or viewed the lecture, you will know that we are in for a special treat this evening. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Erskine Clark to offer a summary of his Curry family lecture. All right, am I on? Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Bird, for that uh, generous introduction and for reminders that I am an old, retired uh, professor for whom the word Zoom uh, conjures up uh, fast cars, 
of a reckless youth, uh, reckless in a kind of Presbyterian way. I do want to begin uh, this summary by emphasizing once again what an honor it is for me to be a part of this celebration of the Curry Professorship at Union Presbyterian Seminary. To put together the name Curry with the name Union Presbyterian Seminary is a reminder of the gratitude that we have for a distinguished Presbyterian family and the love we have for an institution that has served the church over the generations in such remarkable ways. And I will say that it is an institution that we continue to look to with confidence for leadership in these hard days. The current professorship in the history and mission of the church links the study of the history of the church with the mission of the church. It seemed appropriate then on this occasion to explore this link between a moment in the history of the church and its mission in the face of pandemics and endemic infections. As a way of introduction in the lecture itself, I look briefly at two important historians at Union, E.T. Thompson and Jim Smiley, and how they linked their historical work with their understanding of the mission of the church in their day. For Thompson, the old white Southern Presbyterian Church's mission involved moving out of the backwaters of the American South into the mainstream of progressive modern church life. The white Southern Church had a mission to escape the white South's cultural nostalgia, what he called the dead hand of the past, the old orthodoxies that functioned as an ideological cover for racist society. The church had a mission to join the progressive forces in American life and his three volume history of Presbyterians in the South was intended to serve that mission. Smiley faced the different social and cultural context of the radical individualism of the free market and of a therapeutic culture. During the time of his teaching at Columbia, at, I may make that mistake more than once, <laughs> at Union, uh, he faced not so much a culture of nostalgia, but the culture of forgetfulness in a consumer society. So he was concerned with helping the church remember its past so it could more fully engage the mission of the church in an individualistic society preoccupied with self-fulfillment in the present moment. As many of you know, he was extraordinarily eager for his students and for church members to learn some history, to remember the past as a resource for facing the missional challenges of his day. His work as editor of American Presbyterians, a journal of Presbyterian history, was a demonstration of his commitment. So we're facing today the question of the mission of the church in the midst of the death and social upheaval of a pandemic. Pastors and local church leaders are struggling often with very creative ways to find a way forward for congregational life and mission. And institutions of the church, including seminaries, are facing hard questions about their life and mission in the church's life. What, for example, will be the mission of Union and of my own Columbia as new, hard realities emerge 
from this pandemic. In light of our present social context, could some area of the church's history be one resource for the church as it faces the dangers of a world in the midst of a pandemic? I thought it would be worthwhile to try to draw these themes together by looking at pandemics, endemic infections, and early U.S. Protestant missions. The lecture itself focused primarily on West Africa and how early U.S. missionaries in West Africa experienced the ravages of malaria and how they responded to its assaults. As children of the Enlightenment, they looked to science for life preservers and answers but as children of the church and of Christian faith, they also found themselves standing with humility before the providence of God as they struggled with the pressing issues of why that went beyond empirical observations and answers. What was the meaning in the purposes of God for the suffering and death they saw all around them and that they themselves faced. They persevered and worked in amazing ways because they had a vision of God's good purposes for Africa and for the raising up of an indigenous clergy for a truly African church. The final part of the lecture moves from historical investigation to the language of faith, the mother tongue of Christians. These early U.S. missionaries in West Africa are a part of the great cloud of witnesses who surround us and who cheer us on to run with perseverance the race that is now set before us as we look into the face of a deepening world crisis. And this cloud of witnesses, including these early West African missionaries, call us as we seek to run our race. They call us to look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who goes before us into the midst of this pandemic and who invites us to follow him. So that's a summary of the lecture. I hope that the lecture and its summary is at least some help and encouragement as we struggle together to discern where God is beckoning us, calling the church into a world of danger and of hope. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for an outstanding summary of your uh, broader lecture. Uh, as I said earlier, I was wondering how you, why on earth you were going to do that, to, to pull it off, but you offered a succinct summary of an excellent paper. So thank you very much. I hope that you can hear the silent applause that is, uh, is now being given for you across the Zoom platform. As a reminder to all participants, the Q&A room is open to receive your questions, so please submit those as we proceed now. But let me begin this time of question and answer with an opening question, if I may. Dr. Clark, how much do you think the experience and the correspondence of early 19th century missionaries such as the Wilsons and the Williams that you refer to in your paper, influenced the later emergence of medical missions within the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions? Well, let me begin uh, by saying that I fortunately um, have these questions um, already before me. You sent them to me ahead of time. So uh, I, um, I have some notes that I will be referring to in, um, in response. 
I'm confident that the suffering of so many missionaries encouraged the establishment of what would become of what would come to be known as medical missions. At least I'm confident of that in regard to uh, the West African missionaries associated with the American board. The missionaries were desperate for what Leighton Wilson called a real physician, that is someone who was trained at a medical school and not simply someone who had a how-to book on medicine that was those were so popular in the early parts of the 19th century. William Walker wrote to the American board, do find us a physician or we shall die. A physician finally arrived in the, at the Gabon mission in 1850, and he gave his attention not only to the missionaries, but also to the students and other of the indigenous people, the Mapangwe, uh, who were there in the Gabon est estuary. But it would be uh, decades before there was anything like what we think of as a medical mission with a hospital before that would be established. The Albert Schweitzer Hospital of the French Protestant Church established in Gabon in 1912 uh, became a model for many others. The intent was to spread the gospel by the example of Christian labor of healing. So basically in the early years, you had no physician there. Then a physician arrived in 1850, but again, what we think of as medical missions, that was further down the road. It would be some decades before those hospitals would be established at least in the part of the world that I was studying. Thank you, Dr. Clark. That's very insightful for us. And I have a follow-up question, if that's okay, to give folks time to uh, give their questions to the Q&A uh, room. So you mentioned in your paper an understandably heavy reluctance on the part of the American Board for Foreign Missions to send missionaries to West Africa, at least in the early decades of the 19th century because as you note, European and European American missionaries were quote, dying like flies because of malaria. So I want to ask how was that reluctance eventually overcome and how were missionaries theologically trained by the board to face the perils of the journey ahead? Well, the reluctance to uh, send missionaries to West Africa, as you said, was related to um, mm -hmm to malaria and just the uh, death of missionaries <clears throat> often as soon as they arrived within a, within a few months. But that reluctance was finally overcome by the insistence that West Africa not be ignored, but be a part of the U.S. Protestant mission uh, movement. The American board had a great vision of participating with other mission societies in efforts to preach the gospel throughout the earth. And West Africa was a part of all the world. So that was a part, that was, a, that was the fundamental way that um, the American board began to find missionaries uh, that they identified that would be um, trained to go out. Now, the, the American board did not do the theological education of the, of the missionaries. So um, they went to Andover, they went to Princeton, to, um, to, to, I don't think there was one from Union at this particular period. Uh, Leighton was in the first graduating class at Columbia, but uh, they went out uh, already trained. One thing to say about the, this, and those of you who are missiologists will be very much alert to this, is that they were remarkable linguists. And one of the primary things that they had in, as a goal was um, to translate the Bible. So um, that, re that required not only learning the language, but developing a, um, a grammar for, for a particular 
the language and and also um, an alphabet for for that language. So it was remarkable, remarkable uh, work. One other thing I think that's important to note is that um, these West African these missionaries to West Africa in these early years felt a great responsibility because of the horrors of the international slave trade and the, the devastation that had been brought to Africa by the international slave trade. And uh, the Wilson, for example, were from uh, South Carolina and Georgia, and they felt a very heavy responsibility to, that the that the church, in one way it could respond to that, was uh, to, uh, to bring the gospel to, to West Africa. And they were all strong abolitionists, strong abolitionists, and um, they uh, fought against the international slave trade, which was primarily aimed at that period to Brazil and to Cuba. So that played a role as well. Thank you, Dr. Clark. As a historian myself, I am inspired to ask uh, further questions about this and this particular subject. So thank you for, uh, for inspiring me to look, look further. Mm. I would li like to now turn the floor over to Dr. Stan Skreslet to pose his question. Okay. Uh, Erskine, thank you very much uh, for uh, that lovely uh, summary, and uh, I want to say that I appreciate your dexterity uh, in being able to uh, not only shift platforms, but also shift uh, the subject of the lecture. Uh, I see that we're starting to get some questions on the Q&A, and uh, one of them I think uh, is worth asking right now before I even get to my own question. And uh, the question asks, uh, where did the title come from? Uh, the title uh, comes from a letter from uh, William Walker to the American board. Um, his, he, uh, his wife had died, well, his first wife had died shortly after he arrived. He, he married a few years later. And uh, when she died, it was a, a terrific um, blow to him. And um, so this was a part of the anguish that flowed out of that. I should have mentioned that in the, um, in the summary, but um, it went past me. That's fine. Um, so I want to ask my question. Um, I, I was uh, interested in what you say on page four about the study of Christian history as a resource for the church, and your mention of Dr. E.T. Thompson just before this uh, in the paper. And it strikes me that Dr. E.T. was a historian that not only studied the past, but in light of what he learned about that history, acted in his own time to shape a possible future. Could you say anything more about Dr. E.T.? as a public figure and as a public intellectual uh, acting within the larger PCUS uh, church community? Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, many of us who are participating in this will uh, acknowledge the very important role that he played not only in the larger church, but for us, for us personally. Um, one is a very interesting historian. You had asked in your written uh, question to me about was he a um, was he a professional historian about his as a being a professional historian, and um, in many ways I think he was not a professional historian, at least not a professional historian like say Jim Smiley was very much a professional historian, a professional historian engages other historians around uh, different issues that are being debated and and they to understand uh, how a particular period the life of a particular period so um, and it seems a strange thing to say that someone who wrote three big 
volumes of history of the Presbyterians in the South was not a professional historian. But let me give an example. Suppose you look at the period of Reconstruction. A professional historian would um, be engaged with questions like, how continuity was there between Bellum South and the, uh, and the Reconstruction period? How much continuity was there? How much discontinuity? Mm -hmm. He was writing about the church in the period of Reconstruction. He doesn't engage that larger question. You can look at in notes and you see these marvelous notes about the minutes of the General Assembly and Presbyteries and so on. It's very, very rich, but it's not what a, a professional historian would do. So um, it, a professional historian would engage those questions, how did the life of the church reflect that um, debate? Um, so, so then there's a the question about his public, uh, the way in which he was a, um, a was he a public theologian? Well, he was not a public theologian like, say, John Leith was with reform, his book on the Reformed tradition, or Shirley Guthrie with his book on Christian doctrine, uh, Al Wynn with his work on a confession of the, of the church. He was not that kind of public theologian. But I think if you were to ask those who lived through those years with him, was he a public theologian? You would say, yes, he was. And the primary reason would be because of, or at least a primary reason, would be because of his um, little book on the spirituality of the church. Uh, that had a profound impact yeah. on the life of the old Southern Presbyterian church. So in some ways, I think of him as um, the conscience of the, of the old Southern church. Ben Lacey Rose at Union played a role as a, um, a pastor to the church through his columns is in church papers mm -hmm. and he would help with he would give a kind of dear abby response to a problem in the life of the church that's not fair but to say dear abby but he would give a pastoral response mm -hmm. to a question in the life of church well what uh, thompson did uh, including with his biblical his biblical um columns his columns on um Sunday school columns, um, he pushed the church on ethical issues. And in that way, he was a, um, he was quite a uh, public uh, historian. Um, uh, William uh, Sweetser in his important uh, uh, history of Union calls Thompson a general. And I think that's so important to remember. Um, he, could, he could answer your question, I think, uh, a lot better than I can. But this is, this is my impression of his role in the Old Southern Church. Yeah. So I just, uh, just ask as a kind of follow-up and also to uh, tie together these two parts of the lecture, uh, you'll notice that um, a lot of the cable news uh, coverage of the pandemic and so forth, occasionally they will bring uh, onto their panels uh, a historian. And uh, it'll, it'll be someone like Michael Beschloss or uh, John Meacham or something like that. And so you do see historians even now occasionally called on uh, to reflect on the past and what it might have to say about the present. Yes. and the way that we act. And so um, it just struck me as I've been thinking about uh, Dr. E.T. that that's one of the things that I think he did. And I, I really appreciate your uh, talking about him as a conscience of yes. the church, because I think, I think that's really uh, very, very apt. Well, one, um, thing, uh, one thing about him, I think, that, that allowed him to do that was his personal integrity. And... Um, his uh, moral courage, he was attacked 
viciously uh, by conservatives, uh, I mean, real far to the right conservatives. And um, his courage in the face of that, he didn't back down. Yeah, so I, I don't know if Brian is still uh, listening uh, or, or participating, but uh, one, one of the things that happened uh, in uh, this period, in the 1950s anyway, lots of uh, donors to the seminary wrote to the president and um, encouraged him to uh, rein in uh, the conscience uh, so that he wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be quite so active uh, perhaps as he was being. So it's an interesting kind of um, dynamic that sometimes uh, plays out. I'll uh, uh, turn things over to, uh, to James Tonetti. Uh, Professor Clark, thank you for uh, educating us on uh, that we are not the first ones to have these pandemics, that our ancestors had it. They responded to us and you also helped us find certain patterns because you gave us more questions for us to work on, uh, educator yourself. One question that I have, usually whenever these natural disasters or pandemics happen, they open up opportunities for the underdogs. Roles change. So here are these missionaries who have gone to West Africa. I am talking about uh, those who came to India yes. are uh, now stuck with the disaster in the family, health-wise, natural disaster. And there are those uh, native Christians who are trained doctors, nurses, Bible women. In turn, they care for missionaries. They cared for missionaries. They provided medical care, child care, took care of travel needs. In your case of uh, missionaries in West Africa, have you seen such role reversals happening during the time of these malarias or uh, droughts? Yes, yes. So um, the question is, uh, were medical practices, practices of healing, I'll pause on the side of your question, were practices of healing among the Grebo people and Mapangwe people with the two that I was focusing on, were, were they utilized uh, by, on behalf of the missionaries themselves as they, the missionaries faced um, malaria and other diseases that were there? And, if I've understood your question, that's a part of focus of it. And I would say that in the materials that I read, the letters and papers of these missionaries of this particular period of time, which is basically from 1830 to, to 1860, it goes over, I, I did some research after that, but it's basically that, that period there's very, very little indication of that. So I, at that time, you just don't, you don't see it. Now, just because I didn't find it doesn't mean it wasn't happening, obviously. And actually, I would be surprised if it wasn't happening, precisely because of what you see happening in the American South. Um, so among African-Americans, uh, there were um, people who were known as root doctors and who uh, had behind them a tradition of healing that went back primarily to West Africa. And those doctors, um, sometimes they were feared by the whites in, in the South as maybe um, providing poison or something for... Um, uh, a, a way of resisting the white oppression. <clears throat> they were also, they were very much used in the, uh, among the enslaved people in the slave settlements. And um, the white planters relied on them. And there were cases of, of, um, of root doctors 
who had learned a lot about the plants and uh, different native materials that could be utilized, um, the whites sometimes called on them for themselves as well. I think one particularly famous one, uh, a man named Harry uh, Stevens, who uh, lived uh, south during the same time that the Wilsons were in in um, West Africa. He 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 lived on the coast of Georgia, south of um, Savannah, and was known among both whites and blacks as Dr. Harry, and he provided um, uh, medical help to both whites and blacks around fevers, around worms, which were a huge issue, mm -hmm. and around things like uh, dysentery and other kinds of illnesses. So it would be surprising, even though the evidence is, was not there where I was looking, it would be surprising if there were not occasions when uh, the white missionaries would um, look, uh, what, what works? What, what helps you with, uh, with this ulcer? Uh, how, do you deal with, um, how do you deal with the result of, of flies biting you? Or other kinds of medical questions. Thank you, thank you. I have uh, more questions, but there are better questions out there uh, in question and answer. So I'll leave it to uh, Adrian to continue. Thank you, James. And thank you, Dr. Clark. So we have approximately 30 minutes to turn our attention to the Q&A room. So if I could ask Stan to search through those questions and pose a question for Dr. Clark to answer. And then James, if you could pose a second question once Dr. Clark has answered that. And then between you just rotate until we dry up the Q&A board. Uh, and I'll interject around uh, five minutes before uh, we're to close. So we have an idea of time. Stan, what's, uh, pick one out for us for Dr. Clark. Okay, so we have a couple of questions that relate to earlier pandemics, and in particular, the 1918 uh, influenza uh, pandemic. And so at least uh, one person is asking about the church's response. If you came across in any of your research uh, ways in which the church had responded in a distinctive way to those uh, public health emergencies? What a great question. And I am embarrassed that I don't know an answer to that. I don't know a, a clear answer. It was a time when the social gospel was having its um, impact on the life of the church. So um, I assume that there were a variety of ways in which the church had to um, respond, but um, I, this is not something that I have um, really looked at. Uh, it would it would it would be quite interesting and important uh, to do. Most of my life is spent in the 19th century, so so um, that period is not something that I have investigated in carefully. I I'm, I'm regret that I couldn't give a clear answer about that. Okay. If I might offer something, Stan, if that's okay, yeah. uh, I, I think that the time frame there, 1918, certainly that, uh, that coincides, there's interplay there with the rise of the Pentecostal and the charismatic uh, movements, and certainly offers a whole uh, uh, new dimension to looking at the issue of, uh, of that particular pandemic and some of the theological questions that were being addressed. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask one, one follow-up because it's another question from Q&A that is somewhat related to this one and then James, James will be posing the next one. So this is a graduate of Union who is, uh, is asking about uh, the way in which uh, experts in the sciences have been uh, working with and intersecting with experts in religion. And uh, whether or not you're aware of um, that kind of work taking place uh, today. 
Um, <clears throat> only, only as someone who watches the news right now, I, I will say that um, in the 19th century, everything, and my wife Nan says, everything refers back to the 19th century. <laughs> in the, um, there was a huge debate, of course, uh, around Darwin. And um, mm -hmm. Columbia Seminary had a uh, famous professor, uh, James Woodrow, who, Woodrow Wilson's uncle, who had a professorship about the relationship of, relationship of science to religion. So that question that, that you have asked me was quite a um, mm -hmm. great question for a long time. Uh, and um, Woodrow was uh, quite a distinguished scientist and was um, a member of major scientific societies in Germany and Switzerland and England and the US. But he was eventually forced out of his position at Columbia and went down the road and became president of the University of South Carolina. Uh -huh. So it's a, it is a, it is a, um, there has been a very tense relationship, obviously, between science and religion. Um, but it's one that I think um, certainly within the church, the, the, the contemporary Presbyterian mainline churches, the tension is not felt so so much. Except around questions of um, providence and questions of um, cause and effect and uh, a kind of uh, scientific understanding of what uh, what's behind uh, this epidemic or, or what are the what is beyond the the uh, empirical uh, answers to um, to an epidemic. So what are what the news? What is in the news is about listen to the scientists and people want, and people are doing that. But people also are asking other kinds of questions too that are deeply religious. And you see that sometimes in column. New, the New York Times, for example, will have a an editorial that tries to address that question, and um, and pastors are faced with it in very important ways. I'm sure. Okay, James. A question, an interesting one. A question about theodicy. Uh, example given is uh, that some uh, there's a group of there's a Ghanaian congregation in Deliver who claim their spiritual ancestry, of course, when they were back in Ghana, they had Swiss reformed missionaries come, stuck with the pandemic, missionaries die, another group comes in. So despite being stuck by a pandemic, missionaries continue to come and that has become a witness in itself. And local Ghanaians say, yeah, there is something worthwhile here, let us become Christians. That's how they convert. The question now is, uh, were there different understandings of theodicy in South Amer uh, Southern American Presbyterians, missionaries that went there, and African Christians that were there? Were there differences or similarities between understandings of theodicy? Yes. So um, let, me, let me respond by addressing a, the, the question that you had asked also in, in your written question to me about different worldviews, because I think that is a lead into, to, um, into the question that, that you're asking. So the missionaries and the West Africans, um, there were two, as, as you've pointed out, the two there were different worldviews. And probably the easiest way into that, and I'd be interested in your response to that, is, is to think of, um, of one view being uh, pre-modern and the other being modern with the understanding, with not speaking in terms of, of any pejorative implications for those terms, 
but modern being uh, what was um, what a, a set of assumptions that flowed from the Enlightenment that included uh, confidence and progress and scientific work and technology and <clears throat> the capitalism as well, individualism. Um, and the, the uh, pre-modern was simply uh, a way of looking at the world that was different from that, it was that had its own integrity and that um, reflected um, a different social and historical experience. So for the missionaries, the place where, um, in, the, in the West African mission, the place where this came, the tension between these two worlds were most clearly focused was around the question of, um, of charms, or Greek reasons they call them, or fetishes, and the, and the use of those. And uh, um, the West Africans looked to these um, Greek Greeks as a way of protecting themselves from harm, from disease, from uh, the ill will of someone, or from slave traders. And um, the uh, missionaries thought that they were um, an illusion uh, and that um, they had no power in themselves. And especially for Calvinists, uh, they were offended uh, by, um, by them because they thought that they represented some kind of magic that um, was a way to manipulate God. So you had this tension there and the, and the missionaries um, wanted the, the, uh, the Grebo and the Mapangwe to give up their, um, their Grigri's. So that was, um, that was one way, um, one place where there was this, um, this tension. Uh, but the tension also represented two different ways of understanding religion itself. So for the missionaries, the religion was a set of concise beliefs and the practices that flow from those beliefs. So like the catechism that they had learned as children, that's what, that's what religion is about. For the West Africans, at least the ones that I studied, it was much more linked to a personal, uh, to personal practice. And um, it was, uh, there was no, problem with keeping your own religion and adding something new to it because it wasn't a clear set of, of um, concise statements of faith. Mm -hmm. So for example, again, looking at these Greek Greeks, the charms, the fetishes, you could become a Christian without having to give up, give up those. So the missionaries began to face the question that the gospel, as, as they understood it, not only, not only um, had to do with truth, but also was exclusive. That is, you couldn't keep the Greek Greeks and become a Christian. So they will put it, they push that. And it meant that what they said was, you've got to give up the practice at least this side of the practices of your people. Now, what they didn't realize so much was the way in which they themselves reflected the practices, the peculiar practices of South Carolinians and of um, the world that they uh, lived in. And so that was a, that was a part of that team. Thank you, that is helpful. Uh, and this helpful question was asked by, uh, by someone, uh, one of the viewers here, and I appreciate uh, the one who asked this question. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, so I have a, another question that has come up uh, from the, from the Q&A section. And um, this one asks, um, what should we take from the 19th century missionaries? So I, we're locating this in the 19th century very yes. comfortably, I hope. Uh, what should we take from the 19th century missionaries embrace of the likelihood of suffering serious illness and possibly death in the pursuit of their vocations as we pursue our own missional vocations in the present pandemic? So are there lessons or examples from these 19th century missionaries who knew they were going into danger uh, for those of us who are trying to practice our own vocations uh, yes. today? Yes, I think about that a lot. I've been thinking about that uh, question a lot. Um, it's a natural question, uh, as, as you say, as we are facing um, the dangers of a pandemic and the consequences of this pandemic. One of the things that stands out to me is the, with, these, with these missionaries is, um, is uh, they looked to science for help. They, they, they trusted as children of the Enlightenment that science was going to find some, pro some answers to the problems, the, the issues that face them with malaria and with other diseases. So I think like them, uh, we look to science. They spoke uh, when the Wilsons were um, commissioned as missionaries, the head of the American board said, science is going to provide a life preserver for us, for people who are going into areas of, of uh, malaria or other kinds of uh, pandemics or endemic infections. So there was this confidence there. I think we, on that side, we need to hold tight to that as well. At least an uh, 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 important orientation towards paying attention to what the scientists are saying. On the other hand, they had this trust mm. that in the face of great suffering and death and great mystery, that somehow God had a purpose that regarded that that was for Africa itself. That there was um, a, a mysterious providence that was at work that would that their lives would contribute to uh, the building up of an indigenous clergy and a truly uh, Christian church that was African. So there was um, the confidence in science, but also a tenacity that was based in Christian freedom and hope. And uh, others say this much more eloquently, but I think that part of what we face is um, uh, how do we persevere? How do we um, walk towards the future with confidence that God has good purposes in spite of what we see, that God has good purposes for the future? And um, who knows what's going to come out of this? Some new, uh, new ways of being church, new developments. Who would have thought but those little beginnings in West Africa, that the, that the church in Africa would become a witness to the church in the rest of the world. The, the growth of Christianity in Africa is unlike the growth of Christianity in any other time in its history, the church's history. So uh, I think that's what I have to say from 
from these. Yeah. Continue to think about it, ponder it, and walk by faith. Yeah. I, I'm uh, reminded, that question reminded me that um, there's a wonderful treatise from Luther about whether uh, ministers, clergy, should flee the plague. So when uh, the plague gets into one's community and so forth, he asked, what is our pastoral responsibility um, when, uh, when this disaster, when this public health disaster uh, is all around us and everybody knows what the danger is, what is our pastoral responsibility uh, in that situation? So there may be some people out there preaching on on things uh, related to this that might find uh, some some wisdom in that um, in that piece. Yeah, I am. Um, I've been very impressed with the uh, worship services that I've been seeing online and the way in which pastors are addressing questions like that. I don't give this is not the historical part of it that I was asked, but the very hard theological questions are being addressed in in serious, serious ways. And um, I just, I hear this and hear this with pastors around and I'm, I'm so grateful that they are taking these questions on and struggling with them and, and with other church leaders. So who knows what might come out of that? Yeah, James. Someone in your trade, a historian, Asking you a question, what resources do you suggest to historians who would be inclined to study and write a social history of past pandemics, especially uh, a social history of the church's role in the pandemic that is unfolding now, closely related to what we've been talking about? Yes. What resources do you suggest? Well, um, I've used uh, I, I, I have used a variety of sources. I've tried to face, um, I tried to uh, delve into this uh, West African uh, situation. Um, I'm learning now about um, some new ones. I happen to be in my study right here. Um, so uh, these are not. These are not theological books, but um, there are a variety of books on um, on pandemics that are very, very helpful to understand the dynamics in it. So um, this is a book on uh, the making of uh, tropical diseases. It's a part of the John Hopkins uh, biographies of disease. So there, there are a variety of books like this. I've, I've been it because I focus on the South in my work. I've been interested in yellow fever. And we need to remember that pandemics raged across the US. And of course, we need to remember before the 19th century, what happened to the indigenous people of North of, of the Americas with the pandemics that were introduced by Europeans. Um, I, I found uh, a new uh, Cambridge uh, Press book, uh, Slavery, Disease, and Suffering, uh, to be a helpful book thinking about the way in which, including church people, responded to pandemics and the whole question about providence, uh, that was the way they, um, they uh, struggled with it. Um, it's interesting, one interesting dynamic was that uh, uh, political and civic leaders in places where there would be, say, like uh, the yellow fever epidemic going on would deny that it was that bad. It sounds very contemporary. They would, they would say, well, business uh, requires that we not play up the fact that hundreds of people in Savannah, a child or whatever, were dying of yellow fever. The other thing, of course, is about um, pandemics and a huge concern for us uh, as a nation and for the churches is the way the other, the alien, is often attacked in the midst of a pandemic. 
and the attacks that um, we see, especially in regard to Asians right now, are, um, are a hint of that danger, as well as the long lines in front of gun stores, um, the way in which pandemics and violence are uh, especially um, linked. And you certainly, saw, you certainly saw that in earlier periods, earlier histories. You can think, for example, of, of uh, the attack on Jews uh, with uh, the plague at the time of the plague, that the Jews were accused of bringing in the plague. And, and so there were these uh, uh, horrific attacks against Jews. So um, I've got an, uh, another kind of question, another 19th century question here. Um, asking whether or not missionaries in the 19th century tended to see pandemics or mass suffering as the judgment of God. Yes. Um, well, that, of course, is a, uh, that, of course, is, there's a very long tradition going back to the Bible. Uh, Walter Brueggemann has quite a important essay that was in the Journal for Preachers recently just came out about ways in which um, the Old Testament uh, viewed the pandemics. And one way was that it was the judgment of God, that there were, that there's a moral order to the universe and that uh, when that order is broken, there are consequences to it. Uh, what uh, Walter refers to as quid pro quo uh, in, in regard to that. So there's a tradition of that. I don't, the, uh, for the missionaries themselves, I didn't see too much of that except around the question of uh, alcoholism, which was a particularly uh, devastating mm. problem for the Pangwe because they were in regard, they were in engaged with the international slave trade. And so um, an enormous amount of rum was pouring in there. And so they saw the consequences of that, the disease that followed the alcoholism, um, they saw as a, um, a consequence of crossing that line. James, we have around uh, six minutes left. So uh, is there one or two questions that you would like to pose from the Q&A room for Dr. Clark as we close? Uh, there is one thing that is closely related uh, to the question of theodicy. How did missionaries to West Africa explain the suffering and death caused by malaria to those who they, uh, to those they ministered to are uh, with? What was the answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And maybe to wrap up, uh, 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 not too far from here, my neighbor in Raleigh, he asked, uh, while closing, are there two or three lessons that you want the church in the US to take away from those experiences? Something that you already uh, implicitly mentioned. Yes. Two cushions. Yes. So the the um, the missionaries struggled with uh, issues of theodicy in the same way that we struggle with it, and um, the, this great again mystery uh, connected connected with it. And they you, know, you could hear um, again in uh, the agony of the suffering that went on the, these questions of why, and and those questions are not neatly answered, at least in anything that I saw. They're simply not neatly answered. So um, there were a variety of responses, but the, the primary thing I would say was that um, no more than we did they have a, an answer um, to that question. Though it, for, for most of them, you see this um, faith shining through and hope again, for what they were about, this deep commitment for what they were about. And so they, 
again, persevered and um, uh, endured and did their work and uh, trusted in the God of history. Thank you. All right. Well, Stan, I think we have actually just time for one more question. If there is, uh, if there is one that is uh, is still in the Q and A room, or have we have we run out of the questions? Well, we may not have got to all of them, but uh, I, I would just like to make one final comment uh, to to those who are listening. If you've not had a chance to uh, read Dr. Clark's uh, wonderful study of plantation life. A dwelling place. Uh, I would encourage you to do so. It's absolutely delightful study um, that has been uh, recognized in a number of different um, places and um, it's just a delightful study and um, so we'll try to try to uh, pump your uh, your sales Erskine. There you go. <laughs> We're all eager for that uh, for whatever we've written. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, I would second that, Stan, as well. And uh, I want to thank my colleagues, Stan and James, for monitoring the, the Q&A room and thank everyone who participated this evening, certainly in those who uh, asked their questions. Uh, and I'd also particularly like to thank Dr. Clark. You certainly have given us much to ponder this evening. You have challenged us to connect these important fragments from history and mission in the realm of pandemic life to today's crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm asked by my son and my daughter, my young children, the questions of, of God and the church in the midst of these days. And they are, they are good questions to ask. Uh, how are we to respond to the questions that people have both in and beyond the church as we face today's new rhythms? Uh, so thank you for giving us so much food for thought. And I look forward to being with you again soon. Uh, and now I believe I'm turning the floor over to Dean Boyce. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Stan and James. Thanks to the audience that presented such uh, provocative and difficult and timely questions. Uh, it's just been interesting. I, I realize I have four girls and uh, they all look upon me and my wife as part of the threatened population in the current pandemic because I just uh, turned 65. And uh, we've been doing a lot of talk about how do, we, how do we be faithful stewards of our health and yet continue to participate in God's uh, saving purposes for this world. And Erskine, this this uh, lecture, uh, I keep saying we're to be careful, but not too careful. And I just think, uh, I think William Walker, I just got to, uh, Ben Sparks asked about this quote, and uh, I, would, I would urge any of you who have not read this lecture to go read it in its entirety, if nothing else from this quote from William Walker alone. He's just lost his second wife, and he says, he wrote that he believed she was in a better world, but quote, I weep because I have a human heart, but I pray for reconciliation and try to school my heart into submission. I am not conscious of cherishing my grief, though I know there is great danger of it. I feel the obligations of duty to the living around me. I desire, this is an interesting phrase, to lie passive in God's hands. The furnace is hot indeed. May God give strength according to the day. I just, uh, I'm humbled uh, to read uh, such testimony of people who uh, face such grievous loss uh, and yet fought to hold on to some deep uh, purpose beyond simply self-survival for their brief time on this earth. Uh, I hope you all see that's what, this Curry Lectureship is all about uh, mining church history, not as an arcane or even professional uh, vocation, but as a means of uh, focusing the church on its continued mission to the world today.
today. Uh, we're called to be careful but compassionate Christians. We are engaged in a fundraising effort so we can shore up uh, church history on the Charlotte campus. Not that we've lacked any. We've had Bill Sweetser and Adrian Bird uh, helping us here, but we have not had a full time uh, professor in church history on the Charlotte campus. And we've been given the green light uh, to try to secure that for the future. This lecture series is a part of it. The Curry family and their continued generosity has allowed their endowed fund for this lecture series and subsidizing church history to be used as seed money for this full professorship in Charlotte. Uh, it, it cost us, get this, $2.75 million to fully endow a full professor's uh, chair uh, in any discipline, but in this church history uh, position. The Curry uh, Endowment has given us 1.2 million. We've raised another quarter million already. Uh, we've got another quarter million, we think, uh, almost in hand. We've got about a million dollars still to raise. Uh, Tim and I have got a Zoom foundation meeting later this week, and our committee has been working hard generating names and planning visits. I know some of those people are in the audience that I can't see, and I deeply thank them for their work and their commitment to this cause. Erskine, I hope you have some sense you've participated in this project through your witness tonight. And thank you, Stan and Adrian and James. I confess, y'all probably didn't catch it. There was a glitch earlier in this because I had the former agenda where I was supposed to come on twice and I just gave it all uh, in my first appearance. Thankfully, I found the correct copy because otherwise I would have omitted Tom Curry from his concluding remarks here. And uh, it's my deep honor. Uh, I, if you got your screen uh, operational, you see not only Tom, but Peggy down in Texas with us tonight. Tom, uh, it's my great privilege to allow you some closing comments. I don't, I don't, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, what a wonderful evening this has been. I want to thank all of those who've worked so hard to make this event happen and to happen so well. Particularly, I want to thank Dean Richard Boyce and Tim Moore for their leadership and commitment uh, to this effort and indeed to their work at Union Seminary. For Mike Frontero for his technological skills that helped produce uh, this event in this format. And for all the members of the panel, uh, Adrian Bird, a former colleague of mine and our able moderator, uh, Stan Skreslet, uh, who if memory serves, was the first lecturer in this series. And for James Tonetti and for their participation, participation and support. Finally, I want to express my deep gratitude to Erskine Clark, uh, not only uh, for this lecture, but for his willingness to present his work in this format. Those of you who have read one or more of Erskine's books know what a careful and thoughtful scholar he is and what a marvelous teacher and what kind of impact he has had on so many pastors. His presence tonight in this format more than fulfills the original promise and hope of this lecture series. Last of all, I want to thank Union Presbyterian Seminary and President Brian Blunt for their commitment uh, to this lecture series. And I would like to express the hope that occasions such as this would lift up the importance of gathering the resources to fund a permanent chair in church history and missions on the Charlotte campus. So tonight, well done all, and thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Tom. I also want to echo my appreciation to you, Tom, and uh, you, Peggy, um, to Dean Boyce, and also to um, Adrian and Stan and James, and especially to you, uh, Erskine, for the wonderful lecture. You know, I actually um, wished I was in the audience instead of on the panel because I had a few questions and we on the, on the panel couldn't type in our questions in the, the, the way the format was. Uh, so I was, um, at, I, you know, I just deeply enjoyed a couple of things I wanted to note. Um, 
uh, for me, the, the similarity in terms of the past, the, um, the, the way in which the most vulnerable are often, um, uh, uh, the most impoverished, I'm sorry, are often so vulnerable in these processes. Um, the way in which the outsider has often become the scapegoat in the past and also in the present. We see ourselves reliving um, these kinds of uh, situations and scenarios that you talked about. And you talked about the word recklessness um, on um, page 18 in reference to um, both uh, the earlier um, missionary movement and then um, some of the things that we are seeing happen now. These parallels are just fascinating to me and I'd love to talk with you a little bit more about it. But the thing that, that, that struck me the most and that, that I'm left with um, from um, your, your paper and listening even here, um, as you close, you are pondering a question that still um, haunts me a bit. Um, you asked the question, what is God, the God of history, about in this crisis? Because you talked about providence. And what does God's providence mean in a situation and circumstance like this, or where missionaries are going out for God and suffering in the way that they were? Um, and then um, out of all of those questions, what is the mission of the church in this crisis, we wonder? Um, I do wonder, well, what is the mission of the church now um, as we look at a circumstance like this? So, I mean, I, I would love to be sitting in the room with you across the table or in the classroom and, it's in a, in, you know, in one of the seats with my fellow colleague students and, and uh, having a, an opportunity to just talk with you about this paper. So thank you very much uh, for this. There's much uh, to ponder and I will continue to ponder it. So thank you. Um, I'm not supposed to be asking questions or, or speaking about this. I'm supposed to be making a closing prayer. So let me get onto the, the, the tasks that I have at uh, hand. Um, let us, um, as we prepare um, uh, our hearts uh, to uh, close, um, there is a, a, a poem that I've shared with a couple of other uh, groups um, that um, I've found helpful as we think about our situation and circumstance about faithfulness, about being a people of God. It's a poem by Father Richard Hendrick um, that was um, posted in um, the material of Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago. So I'll close with this. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But they say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and gray and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family all around them. They say that a hotel in the west of Ireland is offering free meals and delivery to the housebound. Today, a young woman I know is busy spreading flyers with her number through the neighborhood so that the elders may have someone to call on. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques, and temples are preparing to welcome and shelter the homeless, the sick, the weary. All over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are to how little control we really have, to what really matters, to love. So we pray and we remember that, yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate. Yes, there is isolation, but the, there does not have to be loneliness. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death but there can always be a rebirth of love. Wake to the choices you make as to how to live now. Today, breathe. Listen, behind the factory noises of your panic, the birds are singing again. The sky is clearing, spring is coming, and we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul, and though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. We pray that we find new ways to sing, to sing to God's glory as we move through this moment, not unlike movement moments that the faithful have seen in the past. In Christ's name we say, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good night, everyone. Blessings and be safe. <laughs>